Thank you all for being here on a, on a beautiful uh, Saturday. It takes courage to be indoors on a day like today. Um, I thought we'd start uh, today's panel, which I, I believe is called Getting Creative with Money, which almost sounds like a panel on counterfeiting. Um, letting each of these people introduce themselves, maybe talk a little bit about uh, the role that uh, um, money plays in your your career in terms of putting projects together? Um, so for 15 plus years, I've been um, an independent producer. I feel like I've sat in your seats many, many times. And I think I actually took a class from you back in the day. I'll, I'll, like, <laughs> I'll take credit. I'm going to put that yeah, in my yeah. bio. Yeah. So quickly, a few of the films that I've produced. Um, uh, doc I do documentary and fiction films. Um, the Queen of Versailles, Grandma with Lily Tomlin, um, Montage of Heck, um, I, I feel like there are many more. But then starting last year, you know, every film I've had to raise the money and do it like, a, like its own startup. And I was exhausted doing that. And I also feel like I've missed a lot of opportunities along the way because, you know, I was only working on one film at a time and that's what I had the bandwidth for. Um, and so instead of raising money for my next film, I took, and it, it took basically about a year, but I raised money for a film fund. So now I run a film fund. I'm actually, although I'm from LA and lived here most of my days, I'm now living in Colorado. Um, but I, I now continue to produce, but I'm, I'm also an equity producer. Um, and so through that company, it's a pretty new company, um, we have our first film that came out was Columbus that premiered at Sundance and has been in theaters and that's a whole nother topic but that's something I've been releasing myself with the Sundance Institute which has been really interesting. Um, I have another film in theaters now called Lucky with Harry Dean Stanton and that was a film that sold out of South By. Um, both of those were actually just nominated for Gotham Awards. I'm really excited. And then I have um, coming out soon, The House of Tomorrow, which if you were here last night, that's the film that actually received the grant. And then um, we're going to be using that grant to work with um, the distributor and, and more on that soon. But, but in terms of going back to money, like money, it, it's, it's kind of ironic because I always felt like money was the hardest thing to get. And if I could get it, my life would be so much easier. <laughs> and now I have it and it's not any easier. <laughs> it's just a totally, it's a different set of issues, but the same amount. So that's a whole nother topic. Hi, my name is Jordana Malik. I have a company called Haven Entertainment, which is a management and production company. So we manage writers, directors, and actors, and we produce uh, movies and documentaries and television and digital series. Um, and I most recently produced a movie, Hello, My Name is Doris, starring Sally Field. I have a bunch of digital series out right now um, on Go90 and Warner Brothers' new platform, Stage 13. Um, and YouTube Red, and then we also have a couple TV shows, uh, Wrecked on TBS, Idiot Sitter um, on Comedy Central. And I, um, I have to raise money for like everything that I do, and it's not always enjoyable. Um, it's usually not enjoyable, and like Danielle, I feel like I just was in a situation with the next film I'm doing where I had numerous offers in to finance this movie, which was kind of like my dream to have numerous offers. Um, but it really was just extremely difficult trying to navigate, you know, who you want your financing partners to be and how to structure things and do you want to pre-sell foreign and, and many things that we'll, I'm sure, get into in more detail. My name is Brian O'Shea. I have a company called The Exchange. My core business is international sales and domestic sales, so I'm a... Uh, uh, primarily a sales agent, and that means beyond just brokering deals, we actually service the deals, contracts, collections, marketing, delivery, all of that. So I have an office of 12 people, and we're very active. Um, financing is a big part of my company. Um, we finance a lot of films from uh, pre-production. Um, we've started our own production arm, and we're now developing as well. Um, some of the movies that I've sold and or executive produced or whatever, in whatever capacity it would be, would be um, films like 
Dear White People, Obvious Child, Spectacular Now. That's in my existing company, Two Guns. Um, before that, I was involved with Monster and Upside of Anger and Before Nightfall. So, But I've done a lot of smaller, independent films. Um, as far as financing goes, people look to me in regards to their investment strategy. So they don't. I don't necessarily go out and raise the capital. What happens is people with capital and projects will come to me to validate its uh, financial um, wherewithal. So, and I do estimates and so forth and blah, 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 blah. So that's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ilse. I'm from the Netherlands working for the Film Fund. We actually are looking for projects to fund to help them raise money to get their projects alive. <laughs> uh, we have two different uh, schemes for that. We have an incentive and we have a selective scheme, but we will probably talk more about that. But that's why I'm here. Yeah, and if you are wondering what the Netherlands looks like on film, two of the films that uh, Ilza has recently <clears throat> helped with her fund are Dunkirk and The Hitman's Bodyguard, correct? So, But she is very open to helping smaller films as well. If uh, you're not quite working at that budget level yet, which I'm guessing at least a few of you are not. So with regards to, to financing, they, they often talk about sort of the three-legged stool of, of putting a picture together uh, with pre-sales, with equity, and with soft money. Um, Brian, I, you just mentioned a little bit about the notion of providing estimates, and I know for me personally, I've financed most of my projects just with equity, so pre-sales has been somewhat elusive only because it's been difficult for me to attach talent to my projects in advance, and I'm, I'm sure there's at least a few first-time filmmakers in the audience, so that's always a challenge for, for people new to the game. Can you speak a little bit more as to how the pre-sales element works and or what those estimates actually are and how they work? Sure. Um, so what what I've been doing for the last... 20 years is going to independent, uh, is going to film markets. Cannes, which is a film market, not only a festival, Berlin Film Festival, uh, it used to be Fed, which is no longer in existence, AFM, and then I go to Sundance and I go to Toronto. And every single time I go there, it's not to see movies or to necessarily acquire something, it's mostly to sell. And who I sell to are my international buyers. So each territory has a distributor within that territory that will acquire a product to distribute themselves within their territory to consumers. Um, through those relationships and through the you know active kind of like consumption of information of what's going on in the marketplace, I get uh, value kind of like ideas of what elements are worth to them. So what happens is a producer will bring me a project with an actor, with a director, a genre, a script, a domestic distribution, all of those different elements, and I kind of like go, it's like this, it's like that, France I can sell there, Germany I can sell that, Italy I can sell there, blah, 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 blah. And then I run numbers, and then I do estimates, and then I see if that's something that would work for the producer financier for them to have me involved to get those numbers. And I do that by going back to those markets, talking to those buyers, saying, here, I've got this movie with this actor in it. I've got this movie with that director. I've got this with this release from a studio. And then I pull all of those numbers together and I make offers and, uh, excuse me, they make me offers and I collateralize their paper um, when they commit to something and it turns into cash. That's basically what pre-sales is in a nutshell, and people come to me. So a lot of independent films, like super small movies and so forth, I can't sell. So that's when it takes a big equity slug. But if you have an element that makes a difference, and I can, I can figure out how to collateralize or get paper that can be collateralized, that can go to a bank, then it turns into collateral that shows market validation, which turns into investors putting money into films. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Oh, well, at least to me it does. Um, so, uh, Jordana or Danielle, I'll let one of you choose this one, and then we'll we'll let the other take the remaining leg of the stool, as it were. Let's talk about uh, quote unquote soft money, and I think the probably the the most salient example of that in the current market would be tax credits uh, that that seem to change uh, by the hour on a state by state basis. This is near and dear to me because my my home state of Kentucky has been. Uh, currently a hotbed of low-budget production, lifetime movies. Uh, a, a couple of, of 10 million plus movies are starting to circle the area. But um, talk to me a little bit about how you may have been able to use tax credits on some of your films and how they work, uh, and maybe some of the pros and cons uh, that new filmmakers maybe are not necessarily aware of uh, when they get excited about these big numbers like 30 35% rebates and all that. Well, all, a couple things. Um, one is... 
The House of Tomorrow, um, the, the film that got the award, that we did have a tax credit. We shot it in, and, and not an incentive. So maybe you're better at talking about this than I, but like that, it was a much more straightforward process in terms of getting that money. Um, we, it, uh, I, I want to say it was like 30%, but we had to do a special audit after, but it was a very quick turnaround. It was like 90 days after our audit. Um, I'm, just finished a film that's in New York, so we're going to do that. And and I've the, the pro, what I would just say to those of you out there that are working on your first film or something super low budge, I think sometimes tax credits can be a little misleading. And maybe you're you and I are going to debate this or whatever. But I I've definitely it wasn't a setup um, because you know. Oftentimes, places that have really good tax incentives, people there are super savvy, and there there's maybe a deeper crew base, but you're not necessarily going to be able to work the same deal as you can work in a place that's hardly ever shot. There's a novelty to a film crew coming. So if you are relatively low budget, I would also look at that element because sometimes even though you are getting that money back, you're actually paying extra to be in a place that's shot a lot. Yeah, and I think to add to that, it's very much like deconstruct your movie. Look at what your budget is. Look at, do you have actors that are famous that live in Los Angeles? Do you, like, you really have to weigh things out because tax credits are great, um, but it all, oftentimes, unless your budget can really handle that and is big enough, you find that you're traveling people, you're putting people up. You also have to look at the rules of each tax credit state. So I'm filming a movie in New Mexico and I can only bring X amount of people from Los Angeles. And, you know, I, that's, that's tricky. And then you have to look at the weather in the state. And there's just so many different things. And I agree with you also where I shot a, a TV show in Iowa, which does not have a tax credit, but the high school was free and, you know, people donated all the food and we ended up getting so much from being in this, you know, smaller community as opposed to, you know, shooting in Los Angeles. I also shot a show in Utah, which has a great tax credit, and we did get that back relatively quickly. But you've got to be prepared to really, like, follow all the rules, do research on all the crew there. It's, you know, if there's four other things bigger than your movie shooting in that state, then you're not going to get the crew that you need. So you've really got to just, like, look at everything and map it out from the beginning to figure out if that's the right choice for you. You guys both answered that together. So that leaves one leg left of the stool, which is, uh, which is equity. Um, so uh, there's that old saying, uh, how do you become a, a billionaire, or excuse me, a millionaire in the film business, which is you start off as a billionaire and you invest. Um, that's, that's, that joke is as old as the... I like you're still getting laughed. Yeah, that's, that's a really old one. It, you can substitute restaurants, racehorses, pick your high-risk venture to, to substitute in there. But um, the... Uh, when pitching uh, potential investors on uh, investing in a film, and this is, this is part of what my class is about, so I have strong feelings on this as well, uh, especially an independent film that may not have cast attachments, so you're not going to have the estimates. Um, it, what is the sales pitch, and what are the types of people who uh, you look for to, to invest in these types of films? I can start. Um, <laughs> I think it's, again, the same situation where you have to look at what your film is. So for me, it's always, at the beginning, a chicken and an egg situation. I tend to have worked with a lot of first-time filmmakers. I've also worked on a lot of projects that have female leads or female ensemble casts. So for me, going to, unfortunately, a foreign sales agent to pre-sell is not usually the thing because it's I do comedies, I do women, and I do first-time directors, um, because I, I like challenges. Um, <laughs> so oftentimes, I go straight to cast, because I have, those are relationships I have. Um, so I will attach, like, you know, actors first. Again, those actors, whether it be Sally Field or Laura Dern or whatever, are not quite valuable enough for me to really pre-sell a movie. So then I look to making it as sexy of a package as possible, and I go to investors, um, some production companies that finance or film funds, um, some just equity investors that I've met along the way. And 
my pitch is, you know, usually just you have to prove that your movie is going to be fun to be a part of, that, you know, there's going to be success. Um, you know, you have to be honest because the success is, it's, I made many movies before I saw a penny from any of them. Um, and I think you just, for me, because when you have equity investors that are people that, you know, are individuals, you really have to make sure they're a match creatively and that you want to, you know, keep, you have to keep them informed. And so you have to kind of look ahead at all those things. But yeah, I would say that's generally. And also, I would just be very wary, again, for like the newer filmmakers in the group to think that anyone's going to do it for you or help you. Like, don't get st stuck in the, oh, you know, I'm going to get a meeting with the packaging department at WME and they're going to help me raise the money for my movie. Like, I I've seen very seasoned filmmakers get caught in that trap. And and so I... I um, have always gone to individuals. I try to find people that like might have some connection to the subject matter, you know. And oftentimes, I've raised a chunk of the money that's not cast contingent because it's th there's some connection. And then when you're also going to people that are individuals and maybe they're not, it's very hard. I found to raise money in LA, and that's actually I, I moved to Colorado, and that's a longer story. But all of a sudden, I was there, and I. I looked up and I said, oh my God, there's an opportunity here because people aren't jaded. And it was like a really interesting new offering. So that's a that's another topic. But yes, maybe get out of LA. <laughs> you know, like, you know. That's, that's Kentucky for me. Yeah. And, and um, but I do think it's a big thing about also investor relations and taking someone on the ride and figuring out why are they involved? Are they involved because they've always, you know, been an aspiring filmmaker or they want to be on set or or figure it out? The other thing that can be really hard, especially when you're feeling desperate, which I feel like every independent filmmaker is, is don't, if you ha know in your gut that it's a wrong match with someone, don't take their money because it's such a long-term relationship. You know, it's, yeah, they might invest, in, like, I'm still doing, like, K-1s for a film that I sold in 2005 and interacting with people, and, like, you know, it's it's actually quite long, and if it's someone who's going to give you grief, it actually might not be worth it, and maybe take another month and try to find more people. And, you know, the, the more films I have done, the higher that I've made the threshold, like, the entry-level investment. But when I was making my first film, I was taking money in, like, 15k increments, you know, it, it was like a very hard and long process, and and it's interesting because I, you know, as I said, I spent the last year building relationships and and raising money for this fund, and it's a very similar thing. It's um, you have to figure out why people are involved. Also, you know, there's well, we can talk about it, but people that are in the finance world, like I found people that are like in the hedge fund world sometimes versus people that are in the venture world. Like there's just a very different take. But if you can find like a rich dentist, they're way better. <laughs> Wait, can I well, just add to that too? Please. I also think another thing is like you need to, if you're a producer, you need to think about what you need. Like for me, I need to have somebody dealing with the financing so I can do my job crewing up and casting the movie and working with the director. And I need that as fast as possible. So for me, sometimes it's partnering with a financing partner as an actual producing partner or executive producers, whatever you decide, that you trust and feel like can handle the investment and the money while you go off and do your job. Because I think it is, it is it's a lot of work. I could not take investments in 15,000 increments on something because that takes so much work to manage and then you know who is there producing your movie so I think that's also something to look at true but if you're early in your career like I don't yeah. want to do that anymore either but right. like I didn't have that luxury when I had no track record you right. know right. and so but but that's the thing. Like if you do it once, or like it's super painful. Hopefully next time those same people right. will come in. They'll give you a little bit more, and they'll introduce you to a couple of their friends. Right. I mean, it's always too about network. It's like, you know, one per. It's it's one thing I've also found interesting. If you have one person who's investing, who's engaged, they're your best advocate because they're going to be the ones to go to their network and say, "I'm doing this thing. I'm feeling really good about it. Join me. It's fun." Like so yeah. so. 
tap those people and make them feel like a part of your team because then that will help just kind of build your, your network as well. I, I think that was a, a, just an amazing back and forth of uh, uh, just tremendously good advice, especially for first time filmmakers raising money. It, the alignment of expectation between investor and producer really needs to be set early on. You guys have to be on the same page with the people that are putting money into this. The risks have to be outlined uh, very, very transparently. Um, and, and I think you have to, to get people on board to your projects who are, who are really rooting for it for reasons that transcend the financial outcome. And that may sound Pollyanna, but that gets to, gets to the point of people who believe in the story you're telling and believe in the people who are making the films. Uh, and then if you make money, great. Uh, but if you only turn a slight profit, if you're not talking about you know a, a hedge fund type return, um, uh, you know a five or six bagger or whatever, you know uh, uh, selling your movie for twice as much money as you made it for is a real home run. Um, in the venture cap world, that's a yawn. So uh, anyway, um, uh, Ilza, to come back to you for a moment, um, talk to me a little bit about the fund that you have in the the Netherlands and because I don't want to I don't want to get off track here and, and forget about you uh, and what you're trying to do for producers uh, to make it comfortable over there to shoot. Thank you. We are trying to get uh, producers from everywhere to shoot in the Netherlands because we think it's a beautiful country uh, mm -hmm. and we want to expand it. Um, we are working. We have a I think we have a big crew of production uh, staff. We have a big crew as all. Uh, we are able to get you involved with different producers. We can connect you to possible uh, producers who can apply to our fund. You need a Dutch partner to do that. Uh, then we have two schemes, like the selective scheme, which goes into your project, uh, where it's about, and there. Uh, the other scheme is the incentive. That's the cash rebate system. It's up to 35%. Um, on your total production cost spent in the Netherlands. So you need to use the crew and or cost. You need to have at least two heads of department, which sometimes is difficult, but you can uh, make them, like if you shoot in Holland for five days, the people you hire for this five days will be their heads for those five days. So it's really easy to get in. Um, that's about it. We have, you can apply up to 1.5 million euros. All right, great. Um, Brian, to you, um, the current marketplace for, for independent film, um, if we talk about these smaller films that don't necessarily have uh, uh, gigantic casts, um, what is the marketplace sort of willing to bear um, for, for smaller films right now, in your opinion? Or, or maybe spin that question your own way. Um, yeah. Um, uh, in, in terms of what, what makes sense right now in terms of putting a film together? What's, what's the sweet spot? Yeah. I, so Before I get into that, I just want to say the conversation that you guys were having about knowing your audience on the friggin' money. I mean, it's like I'm raising capital now. And it really is. I, I'm much like I've got a big film that I'm putting together right now. And literally, when I get off of this stage, I have to negotiate it. And it's. I just was inspired by what you guys said, that this is the right partner for it. They're not giving me, but it's the right alignment. It is the right person. And that's why I have to make it work, because I know down the road, it's such a long partnership. So knowing your audience and who you're financing, who's financing your picture, and knowing what their core, you know, what they're interested in, and playing to that, and is not playing to it, but like aligning yourself with it. It's like finding that teammate is so important. So I just want to say that was like really, really valuable. It, actually, I learned something from it. <laughs> I was just like walking off the stage. I'm like going, yes, now I know what I need to say to my producer and my other staff. And now I got to close this deal and blah, 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 blah. Um, so, so where the marketplace is now is that I pick up a lot of small independent films. Like I've been very successful with Dear White People and Obvious Child and Spectacular Now. Spectacular Now I had early. But those films were finished with domestic distribution when I picked them up. So what happens is, is finding a good distributor that, or sales agent or, or distributor that knows how to access the different touch points for value for independent pictures is really key. And it can be part of your strategy in regards to raising financing. So saying that this movie is really about domestic or acknowledging the value of the picture domestically, but 
seeing its performance domestically as something that can catapult its value internationally can be a real strategy in raising financing for yourself. And pulling out <laughs> examples of that is probably a good strategy to get a, an investor involved. We do that a lot when we have our own small movies that we're putting together financing or producing to say, we're gonna sell it, with the, one of the strategies is we're gonna sell it to Netflix. We're going to do a worldwide deal after we have a domestic in place, or we place a domestic with a guaranteed theatrical commitment, which would allow us to argue to the investor that we can eventually sell it to a studio that has output deals with pay TV stations based upon what's happening in domestic. All of those points, nuanced as they may be, are important things to learn about in regards to financing your picture because that's how you get these small little independents to be valued for international is to know those different touch points and know examples and comps. So they're not impossible, they're just a lot harder. So. Um. Can I ask you something? Sure. Or, well, I, like an experience that I had, um, this was a while ago on a film that uh, premiered at Sundance. I sold domestic, um, and then and and it was a very it was called American Sun. It was a very American movie, um, but you know, so there I didn't have high hopes for international rights, but I was also very naive, and I did a deal. I'm now forgetting the name of the company, but. I feel like I've heard this from other people on these lower budget films, right. but where it cost us so much to deliver all of the elements they needed yep. that I paid to do that, and I never saw a penny. So actually, for me, it was a net loss. Right. You know, so I feel like that's also, you know, maybe the, that's like a predatory company, but like that's no, something Yeah, I mean, what you, yeah, it could, it could be, yeah. or just not knowledgeable <laughs> of it, or not really knowing the future expense of what it would be to, de to deliver. Um, what we end up doing because our company is, you know, stable and growing is that we actually advance those costs ourselves, but use it outside of our distribution cap, knowing that we're going to eventually get it back because we have deals in place. We have a business model which kind of like, and this can be a good way of figuring out what international distributor you go to, is not only look at the films that they've released in the past, but get an idea from them that they've been successful or not. Talk to the producers themselves. Um, you know, it, what ends up happening is we just say we have a net number that we have to capture on each film that's X. And so you kind of understand where the revenue, what they expect to get no matter what. And usually they structure a deal, or I'd structure a deal if it's a really small film that that money comes to me first. I'm structuring a deal right now where I'm getting the first X amount of dollars in to the company and then we split after and I'm being completely transparent about it. Like I'm saying, this is where I'm selling it domestically so I know it's gonna work, it's an urban film. I don't know if it's gonna work internationally. I'm gonna get the first piece of that domestic deal and then internationally after you catch up and then after we split. So there are creative ways to do it um, but it's really getting to know your sales agent before you close a deal with them internationally and doing comparatives of what they've released. And you can go online and you can see on IMDb what films they've <laughs> distributed in the past, you know, and then you can ask them pointed questions in regards to, um, you know, how did this film perform? What was your deal on this? Talk to the producer themselves. I mean, those are things about doing due diligence on your, on your team in regards to who you bring on to represent your film internationally, which is a really, really important thing to do. This is, is kind of on topic, but kind of not. I, I know I get asked this question a lot, and I'm, there's, it's gotta be on the minds of a few people in the audience, but we're, we're, what, about two weeks removed from this big thing I always compare to the Moss Eisley spaceport in the original Star Wars called the American Film Market. <laughs> um, <laughs> would you guys recommend that first time filmmakers go, and if so, because it's not, it's not cheap to go, um, what would be the best way even if you don't have a project, what would be the best way, if you recommend going, to extract any degree of knowledge from that experience? Or would you recommend not going? I would, I think you should go because that's where transactions happen. That's, that's people going out and selling films and seeing what's out there and getting a sense of really what it's like. It takes, it demystifies the whole experience in regards to selling films and financing p pictures. You see just a trade show and it's, it's really, you'll see like incredible films with a poster and then one small room. <laughs> and you're like, oh. But also, <clears throat> as a producer, when I went for the first time when I first moved here many years ago, and I had no clue what to do when I got there. Like, I just went, and it's true, absorb it and like 
see everything happening, but like I if you don't have a reason to go, you should have a plan for what you want to get out of it because it's very I mean, I was like amazed at the amount of you know, movies that were just a poster of like Ray Liotta with a gun, you know, there's just like (laughs) these things and you like see Steven Seagal, like these things that were not the movies I was making, but you were like, this is like what's selling. And it's great to walk around and look and see people. And if you are a great networker, I'm sure there's work to be done. I felt like I kind of once I I saw and I left because there wasn't a ton to do without having a specific movie being sold or something you were, you know, trying to to do something with. I think it's more for earlier filmmakers, it's more of a learning experience than something that you actually should be like, I'm going to get all my money from AFM because it's just not not that. I found it, it's funny because I lived not that far from it for many years and I would always avoid it. And then, like, I last year I came in and I had some meetings with people that were in town and then I was like, I'm just going to walk through. And I, like, fell into a deep depression. <laughs> like, it, it really felt like... An, but but maybe that's why I actually should go and just do, you know, force, right. face my fears, go in. <laughs> because, you know, I think as independent filmmakers, it's obviously a really challenging thing that we've all decided to do, right? For, for those of you in here that are, you know, maybe, you know, maybe some of you are going to aspire to the studio world and that kind of thing. But, you know, it's a really challenging road and I feel like, you know, even as a producer, I'm not even a writer director. You have to be like kind of vulnerable and passionate and all this stuff. And there it's like, it's, there's no emotion. It's not about that. It's like, this is a market. And it actually is probably a great exercise because, you know, we've all decided to be part of a very expensive medium. So you got to, you know, be savvy about it and understand the finances of it. But it's just so acute there. You know, there's no like, oh, this you know, movies going to change the world. There's like, there's none of that. You know? yeah, it is, yeah. it is more movies starring people you've heard of with titles you've never heard of and probably will never see yeah. than, than in one place I've ever been in, in my life. It's, inc- yeah. it's incredible. And you see like David Hasselhoff, like, <laughs> like it's very, a very strange experience, but you do really learn about foreign value and what, that means for a movie and what titles are exciting and what actors are exciting because it's just not what you necessarily expect like it's a different you know it's it's a few years behind it's like there's a different there's different elements and I think that that's but as like a filmmaker and you're walking around how can you tell like what's getting traction and what's not like I just felt felt like bombarded. Yeah. But is there a way actually to deter like what's to, made. to learn? From yeah, it? it's yeah. what's made. Okay. It's, if it's if it's being made, if it's a pre-sale and it's made, that's what got traction. Okay. Yeah, it's and I built my company. I mean, I owe my company 100%. I have no debt and I did Steven Seagal movies. I'm still doing them and I'm proud of it. And yeah. I do Nick Cage movies and that's what my 20 years of experience yeah. going to markets and meeting with, that's what they make money on and that's what I need to give them. And then I can do Obvious Child right. and then I can do Dear White People right. and then I can do Spectacular Now. But that's the business. Mm-hmm. You know, you gotta know it. You gotta go see it. Yeah. It's, it don't, it's gross. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, <laughs> it's, it's gross. I love my, I love the business. I'm doing it 20 years. I. I'm happy every day, but it is a tough business, and that is a ugly part of it. But it's the part. Mm-hmm. It's what makes these movies happen. Right. I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so with regards to, to getting back to, to finding money, which it sounds like we all uh, do as part of our careers, um, is there any, uh, f- and we probably all followed specific strategies, done things that have made sense and all that, is there any any moment in time where you've? Uh, I'm trying to phrase this question in a uh, an articulate way, but a, a moment that surprised you, uh, something where where something took a left turn, where you learned something. Uh, uh, just a, uh, I don't want to say like it, it it was a happy accident of sorts, but something that, that maybe led you to change how you you did things typically, or just something that vindicated the way you did things. Uh, I've been looking for sort of a random pearl of wisdom here that, that maybe it's just something unique from your experience you can share with the audience. I know it's kind of abstract. Well, just, just quickly, I'm going to say something that I've learned over this last um, 
two years, which has been a really intense time for me. You know, I just I produced four films. I have one in post and raising this fund and everything. It's so funny. Everything that I've learned goes back to the same old trust your gut. Like, you know, if someone, if you're getting a weird feeling from someone, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I have certain investor or, or certain people too that I like went to coffee with five times and then, you know, went to their party because they said they want to introduce me to other people or whatever. And you're like, it's total BS. And I kind of knew it from the first second I met this person. Why didn't I just save myself that time? Yeah. The soft no or the. Yeah. And, no and that happens same too when you're growing up a movie or that kind of stuff. But I think at the end of the day, it's very basic, like trust your gut and. And, you know, don't lose sight of your mission and your morals. Yeah, I agree with that. Also, I think you need to ask a lot of questions. There's so many parts of the process that go beyond just raising the funds to do production that go into selling your movie and making all those deals. And I feel like every movie that I've made, I've learned a different part of it that I regretted from the time before. And I think, you know, with Hello, My Name is Doris, like, sometimes you get, you make this movie for no money and you're very proud that you made it and then you sell it for maybe a little bit more money and you're very proud that you sold it. And then the movie can be successful and you are like, wait, wh why haven't I seen any money from the successful movie? And then you realize, like, you didn't do a great deal. Like, you, you, like, there's just so many pieces that take you to the end. And also, if you are taking money from investors, like, it's your responsibility to be able to master every single one of those things because you are, you know, leading that charge. And at the beginning every part of the movie making process, none of us know what we're doing. We all learn as we go. So I think it's just like you can never get lazy. You always have to keep keep working and keep like expanding your knowledge. Before a movie, every one of them, I get like so anxious and I'm like, how did I do this last time? I don't even know, how did I get here? I tricked everyone into thinking I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and like you just like panic and then you just start doing it, one foot in front of the other, like pay attention to the details, all of that. And I think it's just, you know, you have a responsibility to investors and so you have to kind of, you know, keep it moving. Um. I, I, I would say default into professionalism always. Like when in doubt, there are going to be moments where you just feel like you've been attacked, that you're, you're getting screwed, and you can say everything that you need to say in writing and in word that is the same and more powerful if you just maintain a level head and talk about the facts. I'm a lawyer by trade and, and um, I, constantly been reminded that every time I do that, it has been a real, real success for me. Most difficult situations, and you just go right to the facts, and you don't make it personal. It is not about you, it is about facts. And it just has served me incredibly well. And uh, communication, um, communicating to people, even if you don't have a problem, uh, being prepared, professionalism, 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 it is your calling card. So, that's what I say. I would say if you're going into co-production that you need to surround yourself with people you trust and people that will help you and you are certain of that you can work with them. Answers are not mandatory, but this is the question I get asked the most when I, when I teach about raising money, which is, okay, so you go out and raise money from, uh, from high net worth individuals or from foundations or, or from uh, production companies. Where on earth do you find these entities? What's the best way to find them? Um, any magic answers? My, my pet answer is usually no, although I'll, I'll throw out a few of my, my, uh, my tricks for, for helping your research efforts, which are usually very project and person specific. But if you have any tricks of the trade, please share. It is a hard one. Um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that like your own skill set and personality is going to dictate which of those things is best for you and your background and like do you did you grow up with rich people do you like do you, I you know like th these are real things or did you go to college with someone who started a successful business and you can hit them up and they know rich people I mean I think there's that element of it and then there's also like you know we were at the Catalyst Sundance Lab together and that is 
a way that is gives you great access to high net worth individuals and you you know go with projects and and meet people there and maintain those relationships whether it's but right for that project for the next Sorry. 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 No, no, no. Go I was going to say, but, but I feel like that's winning the lottery. I, totally. That's what know, I'm saying. There's the thing, average. But it's There's all that too. winning the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really is all winning the lottery. Like, I feel like you, you know, it's again, like that skill set. Like for me, that's a community that I'm in. So I was lucky, but it was a lot of work to get into that community. You know, um, no one's just going to hand you any of these things. So it's work. It's work tracking down those people. It's work if you look at a movie that you really love that you think is similar to your movie or tonally similar or you hear that there's funds that are giving money to female directors or giving money to Latino direct. Like you have to chase these things and try to be at events that, you know, these people are at or, or you know, send those cold emails or look and find a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend that knows that person. I mean, it's not, there's no easy way unless you happen to be the rich person, which. And, and one thing I learned early on in my career too, I, I was at that point working more in documentary and like social issue documentary, but writing grants and stuff, every time we would get rejected, it would be so heartbreaking. But then I, it, looking back, I think those no's were so helpful because it was an indication something's not connecting. You know, like, I think it's the greatest project right. ever. But, like, sometimes take that no as an indication that something's not connecting. you got to rework your grant proposal or whatever it is um, instead of just being disheartened, you know. So I'm out there. I was in New York last week trying to raise capital for this production company I'm doing. And we've started it, you know, so I'm looking for a cash injection. And, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years, and I have the same, where do I find these people? I'm literally going to my friends that are like running Apollo Media. I mean, Apollo, the largest hedge fund in the world. And I'm sitting in his office and he's like, I need X amount of dollars. I'm like, I'm not giving you that. Unless you collateralize your company. I'm like, I'm not doing that. So it's like, it's like, where can I find them? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, that's, I'm out there scrounging around for equity. And I've been doing this for 20 years, have an existing company, have a track record, line of credit, all of that stuff. And it's tough. And the key, though, and makes it really hard for me, is like, one, I'm not collateralizing it. But secondly, I don't want to get somebody engaged that's putting up their house. I want someone that can lose the money. It just makes my life, and I'm, I say that up front, it's risk. It's, it's intensive. It's like, I don't, I will know your audience is what we were saying before. And again, it's so valuable for you not only to go out and look but also to know who you're talking to. Know, know that they're willing to take a risk. Otherwise, it's gonna be a really tough journey if you get that money and they really need it back and it's a risk intensive op proposition you're giving them. So just be aware of all that stuff. And it's a little bit of a digression, but I would say, going back to what you were talking about, about being professional, like if you're going to ask people for money, make sure that you have whatever disclaimers you need in your yeah. business plan, that you have your um, subscription agreements drafted by a lawyer because this is real stuff. I mean, and and you know, with my fund and actually with every film, it's in a way to avoid having to register with the SEC. So you're only going to take money from accredited people, which means they're of a certain you know, they have a certain amount of resources. So like what you're saying, I mean, A, you just don't want to get in that situation. And also I feel like the pressure of it, if you knew someone, especially because oftentimes when you're saying, who are you going to go to? You're going to start with friends and family right. and build from there, especially as a first time filmmaker. Do those people connect with the subject matter or do they believe in you and they want to help make your calling card and help set you on your way? And you don't want them to, you know, lose their house. Yeah, and also... If there's people that are, like, think about what you're asking for money for. Like, is is there a theme to what you're doing? And is there people that are also passionate about that? Have you read that, like, this high net worth individual is giving to organizations that are, you know, involving the theme of your movie? And I think that's an important thing, important way to start because a lot of the investors are, you know, investing in things they're passionate about. It's like Brian said, this is a high, high risk investment. So you've got to appeal to investors on more than just 
this is a good investment because there's many other things that they could invest in that's a much better investment. So you have to like use that passion um, to get to get people once you find them. All right, let's hear it for our amazing panel. Thank you.